Okay, let's rub that old chest. Okay, now it's time to get ready. You ready? Let's get started on this video. Greetings out there in YouTube land and welcome to today's video in which we will try to uh, uh, decipher the mysteries of the cathode bias resistor. Why do we need it and how does it work? In preparing for this, I've read all sorts of very confusing and unfocused explanations, uh, most of which weren't that helpful, uh, and I tried to distill all that nonsense into something very simple and straightforward that should make this topic very clear to you, I hope. If that sounds interesting, then stay tuned. I think we're all familiar with the location of the cathode bias resistor. By some strange coincidence, they're always attached to a cathode and they connect the cathode to ground. They're usually rather low value around say 200, 250, all the way up to 10,000 ohms on preamp tubes and uh, on output tubes often they are of rather higher, uh, of a higher wattage, say up around 2 to 4, even 10 watts uh, of power handling capability. And as we can see, the name cathode bias resistor not only tells us where they're located, it also tells us what their function is. And that is to help us bias tubes. Why do we do this? Well, it's to regulate the current flow through the tube when no signal is present. It's often compared to setting the idle in your car. Uh, with your foot off the accelerator, you want your engine to turn over at a reasonable rate, jack, so that when you step on the gas, the engine is ready to respond. And when you don't step on the gas, the engine is not idling so high that it just explodes. So we need a happy medium. In other words, we need to regulate the current flow or the gasoline through the tube or engine when no signal is present or when the tube is idling. Now to achieve this regulation, we're going to apply or create a charge on the grid that is negative relative to the cathode. I'll explain this more in just a minute. Since light charges repel each other, the negatively charged grid will suppress electron flow from the cathode to the plate. And there's two separate ways to apply or create this negative charge on the grid. First is fixed bias, which is found almost always in output tubes, uh, generally of rather high wattage uh, amplifiers, in which the cathodes are grounded and a separate negative DC power supply uh, of about minus 30 to minus 50 volts of direct current is applied to the grids. We will call this the bias voltage. So we're going to have a separate voltage supply in our circuit which will create this negative DC uh, voltage that we can apply directly to the grids. For a good example of the fixed bias method, we need look no further than a schematic of a deluxe reverb amp. Uh, we see here that there is a dedicated winding in the secondary of the power transformer that produces a desired AC voltage. Um, it comes up here where it is rectified, filtered, and then sent in varying amounts. This is the way the uh, bias is adjusted by this potentiometer. Varying amounts of the negative DC voltage applied, is applied up here directly to the grids of the 6v6 output tubes. That said, we can move on to the topic of today's video, which is cathode biased tubes. Unlike fixed bias, this can be used in any amplification tube, including the preamp tubes. And there are three steps. Number one, the grid is referenced to ground, which is a fancy way of saying it's connected to ground through the grid leak resistor. Now, no current is going to flow to the grid because the grid is a dead end. Uh, so if no current flows through the grid leak resistor on its way from ground to the grid, there is no voltage drop across the grid leak resistor. Since there is no voltage drop, 
the grid and ground have exactly the same charge. And that charge should stay the same no matter what happens because it is referenced or connected to ground. Step two, the cathode is referenced or connected to ground through a cathode bias resistor, which is today's topic. Now, we know that in an operating vacuum tube, current flows from the cathode to the plate. Therefore, if we connect the cathode to ground through the cathode bias resistor, current will flow through the resistor on its way from ground to the cathode. Since current flows through the resistor, a voltage drop will occur across the resistor. Now this is an important part and we need to focus on this. If a voltage drop occurs between the ground, which is the B-, minus, the source of electrons for the cathode, if a voltage drop occurs across this resistor, then this side of the resistor, the dropped side of the resistor, is going to be less negative than the ground. If the voltage drop is 25 volts of direct current, then we can say that the dropped end of the resistor is 25 volts more positive than ground. Therefore, and I'm sure you've noticed on schematics or even from your own uh, measurements uh, taken uh, in amplifier circuits, the cathode actually has a positive charge relative to ground of about 25 volts DC in our example here. Often on schematics it might say 3 or 4 uh, volts DC, but in this particular case let's say 25. Okay, so we have a cathode with a plus 25 volt DC charge relative to ground. We also have a grid which is referenced or connected to ground through a grid leak resistor across which there is no voltage drop. So the grid and ground are at exactly the same voltage potential or charge and the cathode is 25 volts more positive than the grid. Which brings us to step three of the cathode biased litany here, and that is that since the cathode is positive relative to the grid, and it is, in this case 25 volts more positive than the grid, then we can also say that the grid is minus 25 volts or negative 25 volts relative to the cathode. If that's the least bit confusing, I hope this diagram will help a little bit. If the cathode is charged at plus 25 volts DC relative to the grid and ground, remember the grid and ground are at the same charge, then the grid is charged at minus 25 volts DC relative to the cathode. It's sort of like we have a battery and uh, we're going to tell what the uh, charge of the battery is. If we look at the positive pole relative to the negative, it'll be, say, plus 12 volts. If we measure from the negative pole relative to the positive pole, it will be charged at minus 12 volts DC. Uh, it all depends on your point of reference when you're trying to measure charge. So, as you can see, we've ended up at the same place using the cathode bias method as we did with the fixed bias method, and that is that the grid has a negative charge relative to the cathode. In the fixed bias method, we sent in a negative voltage to the grid to make it negative. In the cathode bias method, we indirectly made the grid negative by making the cathode positive. Now just to prove that I'm not making all this up, I'm going to take the back off of that supra tremor verb that I just finished building and take measurements of voltage drop, cathode to ground charge, uh, grid to ground charge, and other measurements that I have 
shown you here, but I'm going to actually go in and see if reality matches theory, okay, which I think is the acid test. So let's take a look at the tremor verb circuit and see what we can find out about it. Rusty, you ready to help me with this cathode bias resistor video? Huh? You're looking pretty energetic. Are you ready? You gonna pitch in? Um, I'm guessing not. Okay, here's a diagram to show the measurements that I intend to take to see if the theory that we've discussed is true. First off, we're going to measure the voltage drop across the cathode bias resistor and write it in this space. Then we're going to see if this voltage drop really did create a positive charge on the cathode. So we're going to measure the voltage between the cathode and ground and write it here, as well as whether it's positive or negative. Next, let's figure out the voltage between the grid and ground. We've been told that it's essentially zero because there is no voltage drop across the grid leak resistor since no current is going to be flowing to the grid. And last, let's measure the potential between the grid and cathode to see if the cathode bias resistor really does create a net negative charge on the grid, which will then uh, regulate the amount of current that flows through the tube at idle. Okay, we've got the back off of the supero tremor verb. And this should be a site familiar to uh, anybody who's been following the eight video series on how this amp was built. The first measurement I intend to take is the voltage drop across the 750 ohm cathode bias resistor for the 6 V6 tube right down here. Okay, the amp is plugged in and we're starting to develop our voltage drop across that resistor. And it seems to have settled down to minus 25.85 volts. Now I've connected the probes between pin 8, which is the cathode of the 6V6, and a good solid chassis ground. And the voltage between the cathode and ground is a positive 25.66 volts. So it does appear that the voltage drop across the cathode bias resistor does indeed create a positive charge on the cathode. Next I leave my uh, negative lead here on the chassis ground and I move the positive over to the wire that is feeding the grid of the 6V6. So this will be the voltage between the grid and ground. We can see here that the voltage potential is jumping all around but it is down in the like 9 millivolts range which is very very close to zero. Now for a final measurement let's measure the voltage potential between the cathode and the grid of the 6V6. So we can see the voltage potential is building up before finally stabilizing at about 25.2 volts. Now so we can calculate the uh, plate dissipation for the 6V6. I'm going to measure the net plate uh, voltage between the plate and the cathode. And we can see that it's pretty well stabilized at about 342 volts. Now, because this amp has a variable bias switch, we can, with a flip of this toggle switch, reduce the cathode bias resistor's value from a 759 ohms down to 655 ohms, which is about a 100 ohm difference. Now, if our theory is correct, reducing the value of the cathode bias resistor should also reduce the potential difference between the grid and the cathode, resulting in the grid being less negative relative to the cathode and therefore less inhibitory to the electrons that are trying to flow from the cathode to the plate. 
we should see the plate current increase uh, if we reduce the cathode BIOS resistor value. Remember that our grid to cathode potential uh, with the 759 ohm cathode BIOS resistor was minus 25.15. So we would expect a lower difference now between the grid and cathode. And sure enough, it looks like it's stabilized at about minus 24.07. Hey Rusty. Rusty, you ready to help me with this cathode bias resistor video? Hmm? Are your paws all rested up and ready to hold the camera? Well, I can tell you're enthusiastic. Okay, let's get started. Okay, let's take an overall look at this and see if we can come up with some conclusions. Number one, as expected, the amount of voltage drop is directly related to the resistance uh, of the cathode bias resistor. Therefore, we have a more positive charge on the cathode the higher the cathode bias resistor value is. And as a result, we have a more negative charge on the grid when we have a higher uh, cathode bias resistance than with a lower cathode bias resistance. Since the inhibition of the grid will be greater the more negative it is, we would expect then that the plate current would be lower for the high value resistor and it is. Notice that the plate current at 759 is only 34 milliamps. When we drop resistance, we will lower the amount of grid inhibition and its negative bias voltage and we'll get more plate current, 34 versus 37.4 milliamps. And the plate dissipation calculated uh, from these values will be 11.65 with the 759 ohm cathode bias resistor, 12.8 watts for the 655 ohm resistor. As you can see, this is why I picked the 759 ohm resistor because this is an ideal value for plate dissipation. Throughout this, the potential of the grid to ground remained about zero. So our measurements exactly uh, coincide with the expectations that we might have had by looking at the theory of how cathode bias resistors function. Well, I hope this all made sense. If any part of it eluded you, then go back and watch again and hopefully it will uh, become clear. I really appreciate the time that you spend watching these videos and I enjoy reading your comments. So until the fifth and final video in this series is posted, uh, I'll see you then, and I hope you stay safe and stay healthy. Bye for now. Okay, Jackie, here's your toy. Are you ready? Bring it back. Bring it back to Papa. Good boy. Come on. Show people that you can retrieve. Well, that was pretty good. Okay, let's give it another try, Jackie. Here's your toy. Ready? Good boy. Bring it back. Good boy. See? He can retrieve. Good boy, Jack. Let's throw it again. Okay, Jack. Here's your toy. Ready to retrieve. There it goes. Bring it back to Papa. Well, a little short, but... That was better than you've been doing. 